Well, I'm Eric Van Stryland, and I'm a nonlinear optics guy. So I look at the nonlinear interaction of light with matter from pulse widths from, oh, say, uh, 10 femtoseconds all the way up to 10 nanoseconds. And we do, I do a lot of nonlinear spectroscopy. So my favorite nonlinear optical device are my glasses. I go outside in the sunlight. They turn dark in about 30 seconds. We look at things that are similar to that, except they'll get dark uh, and change their properties of, of both absorption and refraction in the order of uh, about 10 orders of magnitude faster than that. And you can use those devices for things like uh, protecting your eyes from people with uh, lasers. So it's getting more important uh, as time goes on. But right now, those lasers are, for the most part, fairly innocuous. But in the future, as these things get cheaper and cheaper, when they go to pulse sources, in principle, they could blind people. Uh, and blinding pilots is a rather dangerous uh, uh, thing to have happen. So there are people interested in being able to make devices that will shut off bright light sources basically instantaneously to protect uh, pilots' eyes. And that's an important problem and also a very difficult problem. So, well, you can do it. Uh, we've actually made devices. Unfortunately, they're about this thick. Uh, because they have an intermediate focal plane in between where you, you do it because the eye, unfortunately, or fortunately, the eye amplifies the light intensity about five orders of magnitude by the time it hits the retina. So for wavelengths that get through the vitreous humor, you've got a real problem. Uh, for so-called eye-safe lasers, it's not quite so bad. You can block the light uh, uh, before it damages the, the outside part of the eye. So. The, the nonlinear optics part of that is uh, it's both materials and nonlinear optics. I'm the optics end of, the, of that, and we have partners, again, from around the world who send us their materials. So it's a feedback loop. They make materials. We study their nonlinear optical properties. We feed back to them what the nonlinear properties are. They make an adjustment. This works very well, for example, for organic materials. They, they make, a, make a new organic material, put another ligand on it, and they send it to us. What did that do? And th this feedback loop then produces better and better materials, depending on whether you want more nonlinear optical materials or, or a less nonlinear material. So both, both processes are useful for different types of devices. Uh, so we, we've invented a number of different techniques that allow us to separate the various nonlinearities that occur in these materials. Uh, and that's been a very difficult problem over the past, oh, I don't know, 40 or more years. Uh, trying to get really good numbers. And so we pride ourselves in giving people who supply us with materials, we're not materials people, we get the materials from other people around the world, we supply them with good values of the, both the nonlinear absorption coefficients and the nonlinear refractive index and how they vary with wavelengths, focusing geometries, pulse width, etc. So then people can design devices around, based on those material parameters and get, get, make better devices. It's a never-ending process. I mean, the, the variety of materials you get from different people is, is endless, especially in the organic regime. Uh, and so uh, we, we, I don't think we're going to run out of business for a long time. And we're, you know, we, have, we have multiple laser systems that span, as I said, six orders of magnitude in pulse width and all the way from the far IR at, at, at 15 microns or so all the way to the ultraviolet. So I think we have the best facilities in the world for doing that characterization. And so people, we've got a waiting list of, of materials and people trying to get their materials characterized. Oftentimes, they're, they're, you know, oftentimes people will say, hey, we're looking at making a new all optical switch or they're looking at trying to make a sensor protection device uh, and the like. So we usually know something about what, what the interest is, whether it's nonlinear absorption or nonlinear refraction. Uh, and there, there, I don't think there are really any standards in nonlinear optics. So we are actually trying to provide those standards. Uh, in my prior life, uh, uh, I was a dean of the College of Optics and Photonics, which we call CREO, at the University of Central Florida. And I was lucky enough to get out of that job by my savior, Baha Sala, who took over about six years ago. So now, uh, while I would say I get to play in a lab, the students don't let me go play in a lab, but I get to at least uh, see what they're doing, and they, they do great work. We went to the uh, University of Central Florida about uh, 28 years ago, MJ Swallow, myself, and David Hagen, and a couple other people. Uh, and at the time, there, there were many people around the, 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 the U.S. with the same crystal ball saying optics, photonics is the next, next thing of the future. 
Uh, but most of those places where they're starting centers didn't have base funding from the university. University of Central Florida had base funding, and we looked at that and we said we can hire tenure type people. So we had a vision from the beginning of, of starting not just a research center, which is what it started out as, but a new uh, academic program uh, Im embedded with the research in optics and photonics that is enabling for all the other disciplines of physics, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, chemistry, etc. So we span that range from, from the basic fundamental science all the way through to the applications area and we build our curriculum around that and we hire people with those diverse backgrounds to teach the, the students the things that they need for the, for the most of them go into industry. And it's been very successful.